God is good, amen? amen? I bring you greetings this morning from cold, snowy Michigan. Uh, we, in prayer this morning, we were talking about things to be thankful for. I'm thankful I'm in South Carolina today. Because uh, back home, we've got a couple of feet of snow on the ground. It was 18 degrees when I left Chicago yesterday. Uh, I'm from our church. My name is Chuck Vislam, and uh, our church is Whole Life Christian Fellowship. We are part of NRP. And we are, uh, if you, Michigan is one state, you can hold up your hand and you can tell where you live. Well, we live right here on the lower part of the mitten, right on the Indiana border. We're about to actually two hours east of Chicago, two hours west of Detroit. So we're just kind of right in the middle of the two, town of about 10,000 people. And uh, our church is uh, called Whole Life Christian Fellowship. We've been there since 1995. So we're not that much older than you all guys are here. Uh, my wife Kim and I planted the church at that time. And... Uh, God has been good over the years, of course, ups and downs, things, but uh, it's, it's good to serve the God, and it's good to see his people come to know him, and uh, that's what God's, God's will and God's desire is. My, my wife and I, Kim, have been married for 32 years, going on 33 this year. We have seven great kids, the oldest of which is 30, the youngest of which is 10, so we have a wide range. Yeah, we still have three homes, so I can relate to the younger people here, and I can relate to those because we also have seven grandchildren. So we have a large family, and the blessing of it all is we all live within 10 miles of each other, and we can see each other quite a bit. So that can be a blessing, and that can be also a busy time as well. Um, they're all in the church. They're all serving the Lord, so we're just blessed that. I, and I'm blessed to know uh, your pastor, Pastor Kevin and, and Tracy, what, a, what an honor it is to be in your pulpit today. Uh, I feel a little um, intimidated, so pray for me. I mean, he's what a great teacher he is, and it's good to be here. And also, I just want to recognize Randy and Cindy Folsom for the, they've kind of taken me by the hand and, and been my host and hostesses for, for the time here. I just want to bless them and thank them for the, for the job they've done. They've been really, really great, really great. Just give you a little bit of my story. I was, I'm a, I was born and raised in Detroit. Uh, most of you know that's a dying city right now, but when I lived there, it wasn't. It was, it was a vibrant, vibrant place. Uh, good childhood, uh, a really, really neat place, but I really grew up religious. I had a, we grew up in an Episcopal church, and, and we went to church once in a while, but not great. But um, along the way, I, I, knew, I knew there was a, vo a void in my life, and uh, God really started dealing with me in a lot of different ways. I'm going to talk about some of those today. But in 1987, I came to the Lord, so I've been uh, a Christian now almost 30 years in that sense of the word. And right away, God started dealing with me about going into the ministry. At that time, I was a banker. Any bankers in here? Any? Okay. I was a banker for 14 years, so I'm a, I'm a second career guy. I actually started in the United Methodist Church as a pastor for five years, and then in 1995, we planted the church in Sturgis. And so we have a long history, a lot of ministry, a lot of good things that happen. But one of the things that I've seen in ministry over the years is that even once we get saved, and once we come to know Jesus, and even once we get filled with the Spirit, there's things that Christians still struggle with. There's, there's issues that we still struggle with as Christians that we have a hard time overcoming. I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm the exception there, but when I got saved, there were some things that just got changed right away, and there were some things that took a while. And some of those things are still being worked on by God some 30 years later, chiseling away, chiseling away. I want to talk about that this morning and talk about overcoming strongholds that, are in, that come into our lives. Not only do we bring with us uh, when we come into the faith, but they, they kind of stay on. And we need to understand the principle behind this. And the principle is that God wants us free. Amen? So the premise this morning we're going to talk about is God wants you and I free. Amen? But, but there's a... There's a a, a scriptural strategy that we must work on and we must cooperate with the grace of God so that those things do come off. All of us, I believe, have, have one or more strongholds that we might deal with in our lives. Issues, problems, if you want to call them. Uh, sins, basically, that we're, we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. The good news is God promises complete deliverance. And you know what? Scripture never talks about coping with our problems. Scripture talks about overcoming our problems. And so we're not supposed to cope with that. We're not supposed to live with it. We're supposed to declare war on it and get the victory in Jesus' name. 
Let me give you a, a story to just build our faith as we start this morning. Several years ago, there was a, a, a situation in, in Argentina, and there was a prison that was there that was basically out of control. And in that prison, the drug lords had taken over, and they had basically formed their own cartel within the prison. And it was a violent place. It was, it, the, the officials of the prison had basically taken their hands off it and said, you know, whatever goes on, we, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, in the midst of that, in, in that town in Argentina, there was a pastor who was arrested. He had done something wrong. He was arre arrested and sentenced to that prison. Now, he repented. He knew what he did wrong. He repented, but he went into that prison and became a spiritual dynamo. And he started witnessing everywhere that he could. Now, you would think that that was maybe just like an unsolvable situation. There's nothing they could do about that. But he didn't think that at all. He knew that God wanted to move in that environment. And he knew that God wanted to save those people. And so he started witnessing everywhere, and people started getting saved. Now, along that time, there was another pastor in town who, uh, as a bivocational guy, he, he applied for a job in that prison. You know, God works in a lot of different ways, and very strategically. And so he applied for a job in this prison, and he got the job, even though he was told that, listen, you're going to get, if you go into that prison, as a, it, it, the job he applied for was a guard, if you go into that prison, they're going to kill you. But he, he refused to listen to the naysayers. He knew that this was something God wanted him to do. So he got in there from the outside, and those two guys together started a ministry within the prison. First thing they did was they got on the prison radio station and started preaching and having a program one hour a day, and people started coming to the Lord. Second thing they did, they started having services. And to, to the point, to make a long story short, after a period of one year, of one year, over 2,000 prisoners got saved. 2,000 prisoners. In fact, they had to ask for their, their, their own cell block because they were being threatened in the cell block. So they gave them, the officials gave them a cell block between the drug lords and between the, the, the gangsters, they, right in between them. And so they had a place of influence in that prison and they started 23 different congregations in that span of time. Now, I tell this story for a point. If we think we have strong, this is a stronghold, this is a problem. If we think that ours is impossible, listen, this is, should encourage you today that nothing is impossible for God. No matter what you're going through today, no matter what you have had to go through, nothing is impossible for God. He can, he can take care of that thing, and he can orchestrate circumstances and bring things into your life that's going to, get, that's going to give you the victory. I want to look at, uh, at, at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying. Let me repeat that. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of of Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not natural weapons. See, here's the problem. Too often as Christians, we're trying to solve problems in a natural way. We're trying to solve them by positive thinking or by, by some other way that's, that somehow we're going to solve those issues in a natural way. Well, those things may help, but the ultimate answer is spiritual. And the ultimate answer is using the weapons that God has given us to, to, to tear those strongholds down and to bring them to the foot of the cross. Satan has this secret weapon, and it's called strongholds. And he wants to hold his people captive to those things. And he especially uses them when God begins to move amongst his people. In the history, we've seen when revivals break out and people come to know the Lord Within a few short months, there are people that are slipping back into bondage again. Why does that happen? Because of those strongholds are not being dealt with. And if they're not being dealt with, then they're liable to bring people back into bondage. Now, how do we get victory? Look at Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, number one, and because of the word of their testimony, number two, and number three, they did not love their life even when faced with death. They overcame him by the blood of Jesus. Listen, the blood of Jesus overcomes anything. 
The blood will never lose its power. And so one of the secrets, one of the principles that we need to learn as Christians is understanding the power of the blood and walking under the anointing of the blood of Jesus and the protection of the blood of Jesus. One of the things I do every day is I, I, pre, I pray the blood of Jesus over myself, over my family, over my church. I pray that blood over that because there's power in that blood. There's protection in the blood. There's salvation in the blood. There's sanctification and holiness in the blood of Jesus. So we overcome them by the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus. Second, we overcome by the word of our testimony. What does that mean? That means that we speak faith. We don't speak doubt. We don't speak defeat. We speak faith. And when we share things with people, we share what God is doing for us. And we share the good, the progress that he's made. If you look at your life today where you are today versus where you were a year ago or two years ago or three years ago, I think you would agree God's making some progress. Amen. I know he's made some progress on me. Sometimes it seems slow and sometimes it's not even noticeable. But if I look back and I see, man, God has done some work. Thank you. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not the way I used to be. And my wife thanks you too. Hallelujah. She really thanks you. I mean, at one time, I was a really tough guy to live with. I, I mean, I was a perfectionist bar none. God has delivered me from all of that. Thank him. Thank Jesus. And then not valuing our lives even unto death. What is that? That means that we understand that this human life, this, this life in the body is not all there is. There's something more than that. And so we don't value just the temporal things more than we value the eternal things. We value the eternal things more than we do the temporal things. So we understand that there's a principle here that God wants to deliver us by, that God wants to get us victory over. But we have to understand that this life is not all there is. And, and all these things that we see around us are all going to be, well, you know, down here in Charleston this week, you will believe that maybe they were going to be iced away, but they're going to be burned away. And ultimately, all that we see is not going to even exist anymore, but we are still going to be around. And the only thing we take to heaven is ours and those that we have witnessed and those we have brought with us to Jesus. Amen? Listen, your only real enemy is, is the devil. Now, he uses people, and sometimes he uses them really well. But your only real enemy is, is the devil. And you're going to defeat him, but you've got to use all your weapons. You cannot defeat him not using your weapons. You know what? That would be like if the United States went to war and we had this arsenal behind us and we weren't using it and we were getting beat up. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Why does it make sense that we do, we do battle with the enemy? We don't use all the weapons at our disposal. Use all the weapons that God has for us. Now, we fight these things in the spirit, not in the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal means natural. And as I said earlier, one of the issues that we, we do is we try to fight those things in the natural. Let me give you an example. Maybe you have a stronghold of fear, and one of the things you'll do is you'll, you'll read a book about fear, or you'll, you'll, you'll read, uh, and you'll get some help, and you'll get some counseling, and you'll, you'll think about things that will help you to overcome. You might even do some, some type of self-hypnosis uh, technique. I, I'm, I'm talking about the world out here, not us as Christians. But you'll do some, some techniques to try to help you overcome fear, but the problem is you're treating the symptoms, not the root, and you need to deal with the root, which is a spiritual issue. What is a stronghold? Let me, would you put that definition strong? A stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness, which causes us to accept as unchangeable situations that we know are contrary to the will of God. It's a strong, it's a mindset, it's actually in our minds, that, and it's impregnated with hopelessness. We begin to believe that it cannot change. We begin to believe there's nothing we can do about it, which causes us to accept it as unchangeable, and we accept those situations that we know are contrary to the will of God. So we start to rationalize those things, and we start to say that, hey, that's just who I am. You heard that before? Where are those things located? In the mind. In the mind. It's the mind, the mind is the battleground, if you will, of the spirit, and it's the mind that we believe, and it's the mind that we that faith becomes has to become a reality. They are belief systems contrary to the will of God. They are a source where Satan can still have some control in your life. The Bible says we're not supposed to give him a toehold. 
And, and if we give him a toe hold, then he'll end up having a five toe hold, and then he'll have a foot hold, and then he'll take everything. We don't want to give him anything, amen? And so when we allow strongholds to continue to exist in our lives, then we are giving him a place. Let's give some concrete examples. Let's say you're struggling with fear or worry. I was a warrior. Anybody here a warrior? You know, you just worry has been part of your life. Okay, I, I mean, I found myself worrying all the time. That's not the will of God. Jesus said, why do you worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear? Why are you going to, you know, you have enough trouble for today. Trust God with this thing. Jesus said, don't do it. What does worry lead to? Worry leads to fear. Worry leads to anxiety. Worry leads to a lot of negative things in your life, and it's not a good thing. But we start rationalizing by things, saying things like this. Well, my mom or my dad or my grandpa was a warrior, so it must be in my family. That's just me. That's just who I am. No, it's not. That's not who you are. That's not who God made you to be. It's contrary to the will of God. So we start rationalizing. It becomes a stronghold. Here's a big one for Christians, unforgiveness. I believe the biggest Christian sin or problem that we have today is an attitude of unforgiveness. And what happens with is, is we, we have something happen to us that's bad, and we end up rationalizing it in our mind, it's okay for me not to forgive that person. When Jesus said, after he gave the Lord's Prayer, if you don't forgive those who have harmed you or, or, or sinned against you, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. There's a dynamic spiritual principle involved here. And yet we rationalize, oh, I deserve to hold on to that bitterness. I deserve, that's just, I can't let it go. Yes, you can. Depression, another one. Anxiety, another one. Family, marriage. You know, we know God's will about marriage, but then we start giving up. It'll never change. It's never going to change. They're never going to change. They're always going to be the same. No, they're not. You know, if we just, that's, that's the problem. We start believing that that thing is inevitably never going to change, and that's when it becomes a stronghold in our lives. Not before, but that, at that point, then it becomes a stronghold. And that's when it becomes doubly hard to take it down. And that's where we gotta, we're going to learn some techniques and some, some principles this morning where we're going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to tear them down in Jesus' name. Our kids may rebel. Well, that's just the way, you know, they're just, they're just high strong. They, they just, they're just like this, they're just like that. No, you need to start believing the best about them. God has a plan and purpose for their life. They may rebel against us, but it doesn't mean they're going to be rebelling against us forever and ever. Kids, your parents may be the way they are, but you need to pray for them. I prayed for my mom and dad, and God answered some of those prayers. He didn't, but I know, I know that God made things better because I didn't give up. So what do we do? end up doing with these strongholds? We end up rationalizing that they're okay, and we start building up mindsets in our mind, and we believe them to be the truth instead of what God's Word says is the truth. So we, we start believing that that thing for us, not necessarily for anybody else, but for us, that thing is true, and God's Word is not. You see how dangerous that can be? When you start rationalizing the, the truth of God's word, it, it manifests itself something like this. Well, that may work for you, but it doesn't work for me. Or that may be the way it is for you. Or that may even be what God says, but I know I tried that. It doesn't work. We see that in our culture today. We see that in you know, the issue of, of homosexuality and, and, and marriage and all this stuff. You know, we're seeing that mindset take place. Well, that doesn't work for me. It, that's not the way I am. Well, you know what, what has happened is that people have believed the stronghold instead of believing the truth of God's word. James called this double-mindedness. Look at James 1, verses 6 through 8. Talking about the man of faith. So, but he must or she must ask in faith without any doubting how hard is that but it but that's what it says without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the lord being a double-minded man unstable in all his ways so when we start doubting the veracity of the word of god when we start doubting the truth of god's word when we start rationalizing and thinking well i you know that may work for you but it doesn't for me we become double-minded because what we're having, literally, we got two standards. We got the standard of God's word, and we got our own internal standard we've set up and we've believed and we've allowed to take root in our mind. And you know what? If we've allowed it there, that thing is going to be strong. And that thing is going to be tough to overcome, but we can overcome it if we allow our, our minds to be renewed by the Spirit of God and by the water of the word. 
That's why the devil loves to build strongholds in us. Because he gets, what he wants to do first is plant seeds of doubt in you about the truth of God's word. If he can get you to doubt the truth of the word of God in one area, he can get you to doubt the truth of the word of God in another area. And if when you, once you start doubting the truth of the word of God, then you become double-minded all over the place. You're bouncing off walls. That's how double-minded you are. Because you just don't know what the truth is. You have no idea. He gets us to doubt the truth of God's word for our situation. So we're having, for example, let's go back to fear again. We're having, a tr we're having trouble with fear. We're really struggling with that issue in our lives. And we start rationalizing and saying, you know what? It must not be God's will for me to overcome this. I've struggled with it for years and years and years. I'm still the same way. Maybe I'm a little bit better, but I still have it. So it must not be the will of God. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. God wants us delivered from that thing. And we have to, have to believe the truth of God's word. Now listen to the, to the good news. We can destroy these strongholds, and in the, in the words of Brother Rod Aguilar, kick the devil in the lips. God gives us the ability to do that through fighting the battle. And by the way, the good news is not good advice. The good news is if we receive and, and act on the good news, it produces good fruit. Good advice, you can choose to, to just throw away. You might still be okay, not with good news. You've got to act upon the good news of the gospel of Jesus. So what do we do? Let me give you four steps this morning. First, the real struggle with the enemy is in our minds, not in our spirits. The real struggle is in the mind. Joyce Meyer wrote a book, The Battlefield of the Mind. It's really literally true. The, ba the battle with the enemy is in the mind in what you believe. Now, he uses the spirit in order to influence the mind, but the battle is in the mind. Jesus told a parable one time about a person getting delivered and their house set free, and they didn't, fill the, they didn't fill the house up with good stuff, so the bad stuff ended up coming back. It's in Matthew 12, 43, 45. It says, Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and it does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Now the key word there is unoccupied. <laughs> It's unoccupied. There's nothing there. There's been nothing there to replace what is left. And it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will be with this evil generation. So the principle here is if we don't fill our minds with the truth of the word of God, once we get delivered and once we get set free, once we get saved and filled with the spirit, then our state may end up being worse because we, are, we still are going back to the old stuff. We haven't filled it up with the Word of God. We haven't filled it up with the truth of God. And we allow those strongholds to continue to stay there, and we start believing those things. And yes, we may know Jesus, and we may be saved, but we're going to struggle because our, our, our mindset has not been transformed by the water of the Word. Are you with me on that? So we've got to guard our minds. We've got to guard our hearts. And the Bible says, hold every thought captive. Now, I, I, I've looked at that scripture a lot of times, and I say, if I tried to hold every thought captive, that, I'd be spending all day just holding thoughts captive. <laughs> I, have, I have literally thousands of thoughts going through my mind every single day. I think the principle here thus is, is, though, is don't let any mindset, don't let any thought mindset, contrary to the will of God, take any root. So if you start believing things contrary to what God says about you, you know, the devil's going to point his finger of accusation. You're no good. You're just, you're, you're never going to overcome this. That's a lot. You, that's where you need to stand up to him and you need to say, no, that's not true. The, the word of God says this. Second, strongholds typically sometimes can be good thoughts. They can literally be good thoughts. You can start, yeah, that sounds okay. That sounds like God. In, in scripture, we have the, the illustration of Peter rebuking Jesus after Jesus announced that he would go to Jerusalem and he would have to be killed and raised again on the third day. And Peter said, good, good Peter, may it never be, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. Now that's a good statement. That's a good thought. He's standing up for Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, that's not going to happen. That's not why we're going to Jerusalem. He was speaking a faith thought at that point. But the problem was, even though it might have sounded good, even might have, on the surface, it was not the will of God. He didn't understand at that point the will of God. So Jesus said even good thoughts were from Satan, and he, you know, one of the things he said to Peter is, get behind me, Satan. How would you like to have your pastor tell you that one day? 
Get behind me, Satan, for that is not God's thought, that is not God's will, that is not God's plan. Now, those thoughts will usually come in areas where you're strong. And you'll start thinking, I've got a handle on this, so I don't really need to do a lot of work on it, or I, I've got victory over this, so I won't really need to be vigilant. And you start, you know, those thoughts may say, you know what, you don't need to spend much time on this area anymore. Beware of those kind of thoughts. They may sound good, but in reality, you're opening the door to the enemy. You don't want to do it. You want to keep every door to the enemy shut in your life. We'll try to rationalize because after all, you know, we're saved. We can do that. Some of us, some of us will even start, you know, flirting around with sin a little bit. Oh, I can do that. I can, I can get involved in that without really falling deep. I can, I can do that. You know what, listen, you're, you're flirting with danger because once you get a, get a foot in there, then the enemy's going to grab you and pull you in. So, so stay strong in the Lord. Third, strongholds are equipped with trauma. Strongholds are typically equipped with trauma. So after the thing is done, it hurts. And typically... Unfortunately, it affects an area of our gifting in God. So, for example, you have the gift of mercy. You're a merciful person. And all of a sudden, somebody does something really hurt you, really did. And, and maybe even they did it on purpose. Most of the time, 98% of the time, they don't do it on purpose. But maybe this time they did. And you're really hurt. And it's hard for you to forgive. Well, guess what? That's going to affect your mercy. Because bitterness, or excuse me, unforgiveness leads to bitterness, and bitterness will lead to a hard heart, and that gift of mercy will be quenched. And what, God, and, and what God wants to use you for won't be being used because of that unforgiveness. Let's say you have the gift of giving, and something happens where you just decide, I'm going to quit giving. I, I'm mad at God, I'm mad at them, I'm just not going to give anymore. The, see, what the, what the enemy wants to do is not only hurt you in a stronghold, he wants to hurt the body of Christ as well. That's what happens when people get offended. They leave churches. They're upset with somebody. It hurts the body. Not only are they hurting themselves by not dealing with the offense, but it hurts the body as well because the body is weakened as a result because the hole they're leaving it was designed for them to fill. And God's now got to bring somebody else in to fill that hole. Are you with me on that? Do you understand? So, so we need to, to be careful that we don't allow that foothold, that stronghold, become a, a place of, of wounding in our lives. Deal with the trauma. Deal with the hurt. Don't let that trauma become a stronghold in your life. And then finally, strongholds create a perpetual state of spiritual confusion. When you are bound up in a stronghold, you can't help but be confused. Because on one hand, God says one thing. On the other hand, you're saying another. Now, to me, that, that, that can't be healthy in my relationship with God. Because when God is saying... This is the way to go, and I'm saying, no, that's not the way I'm going. This is what I'm going to do. I am going to be confused. I may not think I'm confused. I may be sure that I'm doing the right thing or think I'm doing the right thing, but literally, my spirit is saying one thing. My mind is saying another. That can't be good. That can't be a good in the long term. A lot of times, you, you get filled with anger because you're frustrated because you know what the will of God is. You know what you're doing. You know the two don't mesh or match, and you don't know what to do about it. And so anger and frustration end up being in you. You don't know why it's there. The simple answer is stop doing what you're doing over here. Take issue. Take, take a place and, and go back to what God said to do. Give it up. Well, if you're in a spate of spiritual confusion, God can't use you like he needs to use you. God can't use you, and you're not going to be fruitful and productive for him. Yes, you're, you're going to be saved. Yes, you, you might be a good, a good church member. You might be doing some good things for God, but God's got more, and, and you're, you're, you're hamstrung. You're injured. You're like a, an NFL player who's on the injured reserve. You're not full strength. You're not doing what God really wants you to do. So, what are we to do? Well, the Bible says we're not to cope with strongholds. We're not to put up with strongholds. We're not to somehow rationalize them. We're to destroy them. We're to destroy them. Strongholds are the enemy's blackmail in your life. The devil has hit you, and he hits you, and he hits you, and he suddenly keeps things going in your life to keep you bound up, to keep you from achieving and reaching your destiny in Christ. See, his goal, once you get saved... 
is, is either to take you back or to make sure that you don't achieve your destiny, that you don't operate in your giftings, that you don't do what God has called you to do, that you are ineffective in what God has called you to do. That's his goal. That's what he wants. The Bible says, resist the devil and he shall what? Flee. Now, resist there in the Greek means an active resistance. Resist doesn't mean uh, passive resistance where I just sit on this platform. It'll take my weight, right? <laughs> I'll just sit on this platform and just hope that he doesn't, just pass me by, please, devil. No, no resist means you put up your dukes and you resist actively. You, you do not put up with it. You actively resist him and then he will flee. Passive resistance, the devil's not going to flee. He's just going to hang around until you, you get in. But an act of resistance, he's going to flee. Several years ago, there was a pastor in the San Francisco area. And, and in this particular man, strongholds had entered into his life. He, just, he didn't realize it at the time. He, he really was living his life. He was doing his ministry. He was, he was leading his ministry and, and, and being a husband to his wife and a father to his children. But along the way, some strongholds had crept into his life, and he's now became a realization. And one day, he was out on the, on the beach in Carmel, California, just he and God. He was just talking to God. And God, you know, I'm having a real problem in this area. I need your help. Uh, but he really didn't know what to do. And, and along that time, as he's walking the beach, there was a swarm of flies that came around him and just made his walk kind of miserable. Anybody ever been in a place where the flies just are so, you know, I come from Michigan and we have flies the size of birds up there, let me tell you. I mean, these flies in the summertime, these black flies, they, not only do they, are they big, they bite at the same time. But the problem is, in this case, in the pastor's place, there are no flies in Carmel, California. At least they're not supposed to be. So being a perceptive guy, he said, Lord, are you trying to show me something here? And the Lord said, yes, I'm trying to show you something. I want you to go study about flies. And he, he went and studied about flies, and he found that once you start spraying for flies, they can only survive for 40 days. Because once you kill the eggs, they can't reproduce. And so it's a short battle. If you get the victory over them and fight it consistently, within 40 days, you're going to get the victory. So as he did this research, the Lord spoke again to the pastor and said, so what did you learn? Okay, I learned about flies. He said, by the way, what's one of the names of the devil? Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. See, here's the lesson. He's not going to fight a long war against you. Jesus went in the wilderness for 40 days. It says the devil left him for a more opportune time. If you fight the battle consistently, you're going to win. Hallelujah. You can't lose. The key is being consistent. The key is not giving up. The key is fighting it day in and day out until you achieve the victory. And here's where we as Christians end up getting weary. We give up the fight too soon. We fight for a few days, we fight for a few weeks, and we say, it's not working, it's not, my life isn't changing, I'm not doing it. We give up before the breakthrough comes. We, we don't do it long enough. We have to fight by Jesus' method. He fought for 40 days and 40 nights. And he said, what, is, what was his method? It is written. When the enemy would come at him, he would say, it is written. And our method also, I mean, who are we to invent a new method that Jesus already gave us and, he, and it actually works? It is written, it is written, it is written. So we need to destroy strongholds. We need to, to use the Jesus method. Now, how do we do it? We need to, number one, keep hitting them with the Holy Spirit sledgehammer until they begin to crack and fall. Don't give up. You know, I, I, we, I, we had a, at our church, we did a, a building project five years ago where we had to make some changes. And we did some of the work ourselves. And one of the things we had to do was had, we had to tear down a couple walls. And they were cement walls. They were cement block walls. These things, I mean, they've been up for years, since 1953. And so they've, they've been around a while. And we found out that those walls did not want to come down. 
And so we, you know, we got the sledgehammers out and we got the picks out and we began to hit those things. And we realized one swing, one, one hit, hit with a pick, one swing with a sledgehammer wasn't going to take that wall down. It was going to take a while. So I, there were several guys, strong guys that were hitting on that wall and it took a while for that wall to come down. And, and the Lord showed me at that point, there's a principle here. You need to keep hitting that thing with a sledgehammer until it comes down. See, the wall's never going to come down if we give up too soon. You'll have a little dent in it, and you'll have, some, you'll have some cement flying all over the place, but the wall will still be there. You might have put a little dent in it, but the, you know, the enemy will come and fill that thing up, so we need to keep hitting the wall. Now, what do we hit it with? The Word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. We hit that wall of stronghold with the word of God. We take the Ephesians 6 armor, we put it on every single day, and then we hit that wall with the word of God. So let's say that your stronghold is fear. I'm, I'm using that as an example, just an easy example this morning. Find some sledgehammer scriptures to hit that thing with. So today, I'm feeling fearful, I'm feeling anxious. Uh, so one of the scriptures I'll pull out, is God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And whack, I'll hit that thing today with that scripture. And whack, I'll hit it again with that scripture. And whack, I'll hit it again. I'll hit it with that scripture that day. Tomorrow, I'll have another scripture. In fact, I might have 40 scriptures. It might not take 40 scriptures. But you look up some, some things to, the, to, the, to attack that stronghold, to take authority over it in Jesus' name, and you keep whacking it with the word of God, and it will come down. The reason I'm bringing up fear is that was, that was a huge stronghold in my life. I, back in 87 when I got saved, just a little background, I was a banker. I was 32 years old. I just got promoted to be the chief executive officer of a regional bank in southern Michigan. <coughs> Excuse me. And I was not ready. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I was, I was unprepared for this job. I, I, they, it was kind of like I was the last guy available, last person standing. They needed somebody to fill. Little did I know that they planned on consolidating the bank three years down the road and bringing it into a, a one big holding company type thing. So it was just a temporary position. I didn't know that at the time. I was in way over my head, and I started having panic attacks. Anybody ever had a panic attack? I mean, they're scary. Uh, you, don't, you wonder what's going on. You think you're dying. You have no clue. Yeah, you think it's something, you know, I got checked out for every single physical disease known to man. And still, there was nothing wrong with me, but I still thought there was something wrong with me. And all of that led to was more fear, more anxiety, to the point where I was having trouble literally functioning. And that's when I call out to the Lord. And you know what? God meets us in a point of need. And he met me in my point of need. And I got saved and I got filled with the Spirit. But the fear didn't go away all at the same time. There were still some there, still some struggling. I still had to struggle with it. And I look back at that now, and sometimes I ask God, God, why didn't you just deliver me all together with that? But I learned a lot in that struggle. I learned a lot in that battle. I learned about doing warfare. <laughs> it's not fun to do warfare, but I learned about it. And I learned that you can't give up the fight if you're ever going to get the victory. It took several years for me to ultimately get the victory to the point where I really don't struggle with it anymore. But in that struggle, I learned, and not, not only that, I learned to be empathetic and sympathetic to people who are dealing with the same thing, which is really helpful for a pastor, by the way. <laughs> you, wanna, you, you really want your pastor to understand some of the things that you're going through. And that's why I think God sometimes allows us to go through something like that so we can, we can be a warrior with you. We can, uh, we, can, we can battle with you. And so for me, it was, a, it was an absolutely necessary thing for me to learn because I wasn't going to get the victory until I learned how to do warfare. And so I learned some scriptures. I memorized some scriptures. I did battle with the Word of God uh, on a daily basis. Sometimes I had to, man, I was swinging that sledgehammer all the time. My arms would get tired, literally, in a spiritual sense, of swinging that sledgehammer. But you know what? I started getting better. And the stronghold started going away, and ultimately it left. Hallelujah. As you continue to hammer him with the word of God in that area of your life, whatever it is, he will flee. And you will have victory in Jesus' name. And you will become a spiritual lion as a result of doing warfare. 
Remember David and Goliath? David had to take the step of warfare first. Just a little kid. Who's going to do battle against Goliath? Goliath's laughing. He's making fun. He's mocking Israel. Here's this little kid that comes out. I'll take him on. But he had to take the step of faith, and he had to literally do, full, do warfare to get the victory. For some of us, we need to take the step of doing warfare so we get the victory and keep doing it. Now, your circumstances like mine may not change right away, or they may immediately change. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord for that. But the way you look at them will, all, will now change. And how you deal with those things in your life going forward will now change. I'm dealing with some people in my church right now that are just consumed with worry. And one of the things, you know, in, in counseling them and trying to help them with is, number one, you've got to trust God. But number two, you've gotta, you have got to do warfare against that thing with the word of God. Worry is a, is a part of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Fear not, Jesus said. How many times is it fear not in the Bible? A whole bunch, over 100, by the way. Fear not. It's a common problem. Listen, we have two choices. You can remain Satan's prisoner of war, or you can declare your victory and be a spiritual marine or Navy SEAL or whatever you are, dodge the bullets, but inflict a lot of casualties along the way. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather be number two than number one. It's easy to be a POW, but it does, it's not fruitful. You're never going to get out. We need to escape the prison and do the work of God. So, as we, as we bring this all together, I want to op open up time for time to let the Holy Spirit minister to us today on this issue. It's really, I think it's really important that we understand what God wants to do for us. Because God, God wants us free. He doesn't want us bound up. So let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning. Number one, do you have any strongholds? I mean, maybe you've been in, in a Christian for a lot of years like I have. Maybe you're a new believer here today. Maybe you're not even a believer here today. Listen, if you don't know Jesus today, today is the day to know Jesus. Jesus will set you free. He is calling you into a relationship with him. He's standing there with his arms open and says, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you peace. I will give you rest. I will give you joy. I will give you victory. He's calling you in a relationship. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Give your heart to him today. When the time comes, just, just say yes to him. He's already said yes to you. His yes is still yes. All you have to do is say yes to him. But if you're in Jesus and you're still struggling with some areas of your life, today is the day to declare war. Today is the day to say, no more am I going to struggle with this thing. I'm going to start the road of victory today. I am, I'm going to take the steps necessary to, to really walk forward in God's victory today. I am not going to put up with this anymore. So admit it, number one. Yeah, I've got a problem. Some of us, you know, we, we don't want to admit that we have problems, we, especially some of us guys. We want to be tough guys, yeah, macho men. I don't have any problems. Problems, they're nothing. I don't, but we're, we're full of them. You know, we're, we, have, we have some things we're struggling with. So admit them, number one. Number two, commit to the process of tearing them down and do not allow them room any longer. Stop rationalizing. Change your mind. By the way, that's what repentance means. Change your mind about it. So instead of believing that's just the way you are or that's the way you'll always be, start believing what the Word of God says. No, that's not the way God wants me to be. He wants me to be free of this thing. I had a guy I worked with a long time. Tremendous anger problem. He just always angry. Angry at his wife. Angry at his kids. Just always bubbling forth. And he had come to the wrestle. You know, I'm just. That's the way I am. My mom, my mother was that way. My dad, my dad was that way. My dad used to beat me. I said, Well, there's part of the problem. There's part. Of, we need to deal with that. We need to talk about that because that's not normal. That's not the way it should be. So let's deal with that and let's get victory. But you don't have to be this way anymore. You can get victory over this thing. You can be a better husband. You can be a better father. You can, be, you, can, you can be more productive for God when you're not filled with anger all the time. But you don't have, one of the first step you've got to take right now is saying, I don't have to be this way anymore. So admit it. Number two, declare war on it today. Do not rationalize it any longer. Start believing that God has something better for you. Now, let me, before you start feeling like, I don't want anybody here leaving today feeling condemned or feeling like God loves you just like we are. 
He loves you. He don't, he's not going to love you more tomorrow or in the next day because you're, you're having a better, you're having victory over these strongholds. He loved you the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not about God loving or accepting us. It's about fulfilling God's purpose in our life. It's about literally fulfilling God's purpose in our life. And then thirdly, commit to, to do warfare. Let, can we put that last slide up there, the very last slide I had? Prayer and the Word. Prayer and the Word. I know you hit this. Well, this, this, is, this is just, this is nothing new. No, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. But it's so important that we live lives of prayer and we get in the Word on a daily basis, and especially Word that's going to help us overcome. Number two, be persistent. Don't give up. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Even if it takes years, and, and I'm praying it doesn't, but even if it takes a while for that particular thing, some are stubborn and some are going to take a little longer and some have been there longer. I tell some people, you know, it took you 30 years to get the way you, you are. It may be not going to turn around overnight. You've got to give some commitment to this, some time, some help to God to do it. And then thirdly, thirdly, believe victory and don't give up till you see it. Because that is God's will for you. Amen? His will for you is not to struggle anymore in that particular area of your life, whatever it may be. His will for you is to have victory. Along the way, all he wants you to do is continue the good fight. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep going until you see the victory. Amen? Let's stand together.